time for you to rethink. You know the word annihilate? It means reduced to nothing. Perished means killed. We know what perished means. Welcome, and thanks for joining us for Rethinking Hell Live, where evangelical Christians discuss what the Bible says about hell and put conventional and controversial views to the test. Join the discussion in YouTube's live chat or email your feedback, questions, and episode suggestions to live at rethinkinghell.com. Rethinking Hell is on Facebook as well, and be sure to check us out on Patreon if you'd like to become a supporter of the show. See the description below for all links and details, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel for future updates. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Rethinking Hell Live, albeit uh, not live. This is a pre-recorded episode um, because, as I have been saying in uh, recent episodes of this show and my own, I am taking an indefinite hiatus from weekly live streaming um, to take care of my wife and support her as she undergoes cancer treatment, um, which is moving forward with mixed levels of success. And so your uh, prayers are um, appreciated as she and I continue and the rest of our family continue to uh, navigate this um, pretty scary journey. Um, so, uh, but I did, but I did have an opportunity. Um, and by the way, I apologize for the dogs. If you can hear them, those aren't our dogs. Uh, but recently, like a month or so ago, our neighbors, um, moved where the dog house is in, in their yard or something. And now they're just, the dogs are constantly barking. So hopefully it's not too much of a distraction, but anyway, I did have an opportunity, um, to interview a friend of mine and a well-known, um, public Christian thinker by the name of Michael Brown, um, on a book that he published this year, earlier in 2023. Um, it was published with Charisma House in March of 2023, and it's called Why So Many many Christians have left the faith. And it's a book that covers a, a variety of different topics, but one of the chapters is dedicated to the topic of hell and, and divine judgment more broadly. And uh, when the book came out and people within the conditionalist community read Dr. Brown's chapter, where he gives a decent, albeit brief, um, treatment of and defense of conditional immortality or annihilationism, I thought, gosh, I'd love to interview Dr. Brown again. He, we've actually interviewed him on this show before. <coughs> excuse me. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm going to see if I can <laughs> pull it up here on the fly. I didn't plan what I would say here in this uh, introduction that I'm recording. But yeah, we interviewed him back in Rethinking Hell Live episode 19, three years ago. Um, this was on uh, January 27th of 2020. So just before the pandemic really began, um, we had Dr. Brown on the show. And since then, he's published this book in which he um, presents a brief treatment of both eternal torment and conditional immortality or annihilationism and he doesn't really uh, he, he represents them both fairly and, and evenly and that really impressed the community it impressed me and so i invited dr brown on the show to let me interview him about it and uh, and i think it, the interview went great and i'm excited for you to see it we'll roll into that in just one moment but let me please do remind you first um, to, if you have not already subscribed to this channel, please do subscribe and also make sure the notification bell is selected so that you'll get notifications when we upload new content like this video. Um, and also, if you enjoy this interview when it's over, I'd very much appreciate you clicking the like button. All three of those things, liking, subscribing, and clicking notifications, and for that matter, also just watching the video through to the end will help the um, our channel benefit from YouTube. YouTube's algorithms. Um, uh, well, one other thing I'll mention is just that it is looking like we may not have an annual conference this year. Um, we have done nine of them from 2014 all the way to 2022. Um, we are struggling to find a um, sufficient, uh, you know, a good enough venue 
to host a conference, and so we may not, uh, probably won't have, at the very least, an in-person conference, but we may do some kind of virtual online symposium or something. So stay tuned to RethinkingHell.com and, and the Rethinking Hell Facebook page and group, and um, you'll be notified if, if those kinds of opportunities arise. Uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into my interview with my friend and, and somebody I'm a huge fan of and admirer of, uh, Dr. Michael Brown. Uh, for those who aren't already uh, familiar with you, maybe because they haven't watched our previous interview with you here on Rethinking Hell Live, um, give our viewers a bit of a summary of your faith background and your testimony, because I think it's an interesting one. Yeah, I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus, came to faith in late 1971 at the age of 16. I was a heroin shooting LSD using hippie rock drummer, went to a little gospel church originally to pull my, my friends out. The people there began praying for me, although I didn't know it. God brought me under deep conviction of sin and then radical conversion in uh, 1971. And when, when my dad saw that my life was changed and I was legitimately off drugs and living a new life, he said to me, Michael, I'm glad you're off drugs, but we're Jews. We don't believe this. He brought me to meet the local rabbi who then lovingly challenged me about everything I believe. So that, that led to lifelong dialogue and, and interaction with my Jewish community also led to me getting a PhD in Near Eastern languages and literatures from New York University, because I just, I was determined that I had to understand the Hebrew text for myself and be able to answer the rabbis and answer the objections with integrity. And, and that's what led me into all that study. But my heart's always beat for revival in the church, for missions, for the gospel going to the nation. So our ministry, as Dr. Brown Ministries, has three main R's that we emphasize. So revival in the church, and then that leads to gospel-based moral and cultural revolution in society. The church change brings radical change with it. And then redemption in Israel, uh, longing to see Jewish people come to know the Messiah. So I, I do a daily radio show, five days a week, one hour a day, live call-in called The Line of Fire. Uh, we uh, put lots of books out on wide-ranging subjects. And I normally write about five articles a week, uh, weighing in on what's happening in the culture around us. So and then travel and speak. So that's what we've been doing for, for many years now. And with everything going on in the culture right now, <laughs> you must be uh, never able to put your pen down with how rapidly things are changing. Um, well, so in the book that we're going to be discussing today, you write about the years of studying the Bible that you did after becoming a believer in a in a critical environment, surrounded by people who were challenging your faith, people like your Jewish family, who we've already mentioned, rabbis and others. Tell us about that journey of studying the Bible in, in, in something of a critical environment and, and how that has impacted your faith, because I think that'll that'll be a nice contrast with some of the kinds of people that we'll be talking about who've left the faith as we dive into your book. Yeah, absolutely. So I understand what happens when you get in an environment with people who know more than you know. They seem to know more than your pastor knows and more than your friends know, and they're telling you how wrong your faith is. It's very jarring. So first, having rabbis tell me that the Bible I was reading was not reliable, and, and here they are with the Hebrew text in front of them. And I can't, I, the little Hebrew that I knew from my bar mitzvah, I had forgotten by then. Um, then with professors, university professors, I'm going there to learn from them. I'm just the student, the kid, they're the, the learned people. And they're there, some of them are hostile to the scriptures or hostile to my faith. So it was very jarring. I knew that Jesus had changed my life. I mean, I was really radically transformed. I was, but you know, you wrestle with it because we're supposed to love God with all our heart all our mind. What if it's not true? What if these are just small-minded religious people that with their little belief system, and once you bring it into the larger world, it gets shattered? So the very questions that people are asking now who are, quote, deconstructing, these are some of the questions that, that I was challenged with early on, you know, in terms of the truthfulness of what I believed about Jesus, about the reliability of the New Testament, about the reliability of the Messianic prophecies, and then more largely about the reliability of scripture at large, or, or did the people that uh, allegedly wrote books of the Bible, did they really write it, et cetera? And the problem was I didn't have anywhere to turn. Mm -hmm. The little church where I got saved was wonderful for 
praying and loving Jesus and, and, and being in the word and sharing the gospel. It was Italian Pentecostal. It, I don't know that anyone in the congregation even had a, a bachelor's degree at that point. There was no in, intellectual, theological discussion I was going to have working through these larger issues. And I didn't know any other believing scholars at that point. Uh, I, I literally did not know any. And then among the Jewish believers that I was introduced to, because there, you know, there weren't a lot in my little church. They were all evangelists. They weren't apologists. So they had great outreach tracks. But so I, I had nowhere to go except on my knees before God with honesty and integrity, telling him I, I knew being a Jew had some importance that there was some calling, some some responsibility we had to God. And I remember being on my face before God and said, I just want to serve you, as as, as and be loyal to you, whatever that means. If it means everything I believe now is wrong and I have to walk away from it, I, I have to follow you. If it believes that if, if everything I believe is right and it means being rejected by my own people, I have to follow you and your truth wherever it leads. And, and that yeah. became a determination. Even when I would get hit with the arguments from professors who were undermining the authority of the Old Testament, denying inspiration, raising valid questions, I said, OK, I'm going to explore these as if they're valid. I'm not just going to look for a cheap solution. If I read some apologetics book and I feel it gives a cheap solution, I'm just going to put it to the side and say, I don't have an answer to this right now, and I'm going to seek the truth wherever it leads. But to me, it, it, not, it did not lead to, a, to a, a deconstructing of my faith, but to a deepening of my faith mm -hmm. and, and the, the blending together of heart and mind. So I don't, I don't have a conflict with loving God with all my mind and loving God with all my heart, the, the two work together like a hand in a glove. Yeah. In fact, I think there's more to be said about that heart-mind relationship, and I'll be asking you about that in a moment. But let's let's start digging into your book, your new book called Why So Many Christians Have Left the Faith, subtitled Responding to the Deconstructionist Movement with Unshakable, Timeless Truth. So let's start by talking about how you first got the idea to write the book. What has it prompted you to uh, to put this book together? So uh, a few years ago, one publisher reached out to me and asked if I'd write a book about what they thought was maybe the great falling away. Uh, mm -hmm. Jesus speaks about it. Paul speaks about it. Maybe we're in that great falling away. I ended up instead writing a book called Has God Failed You? Uh, and and, and this, this really tried to address some of the issues. I prayed. I didn't get answers. I, I've been hurt by the church. Different things like that. You know, where's a good God in a suffering world? I wrote that in a, in a very pastoral way, really trying to, to reach and help people there. And, and then as I continued to watch, as more and more people were, quote, deconstructing, as you had more people like Pastor Joshua Harris, who became well known for his book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, you know, became a best-selling author as a young man, then pastored a well-known church in Maryland and, and fell away. Or, you know, a, a hip hop artist who did apologetics, he fell away. Or a seminary professor, he fell away. Or a well known worship Rhett and leader. Link from Good Mythical Morning. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yeah, no, th that, that, that was a, a, another, right? So, so uh, the more I looked at it, I thought, okay, I've got to start to address this and explain to the body, to other believers, what's happening so that we can minister more effectively, but then try to reach people who have questions, who are deconstructing, and maybe have even lost their faith. And in writing the book, uh, initially I was going to write the whole book on why people have left the faith, and the last few chapters provide answers and, and, and guideposts to get back home. But I felt, no, no, each chapter, after I lay out the problem, I have to, I have to point to a solution. So that's what shifted as I wrote the book. And, and as I really tried to understand sympathetically and compassionately, why many people have left the faith or lost their faith without asking whether were they true believers or not. Let's for God to deal with. It's for us to deal with the end of James 5. If you see someone turn away, that you seek to bring them back. That's our calling. Yeah, amen. Well, now you're an accomplished scholar. You've got incredibly honed uh, academic chops. Uh, you've published books aimed at more of an academic audience. But I don't think that that's the kind of thing people are going to find when they pick up this book. If I'm right about that, can you talk about what your intended, what what kinds of readers you had in mind when you wrote the book? All right. So everything I do is undergirded with academic scholarship. Right. In other words, uh, uh, it's going to be true to the Hebrew, the Greek, to, to the best understanding of the original text, to, 
scientific arguments where they come in and theological arguments. But but I wrote it really for two people. I wrote it for the people who are struggling and asking the deep questions, whether they are intellectuals, whether they come at things in a, in a more simple approach, but to really say, okay, here's what you're struggling with, correct? These are your issues. Let's talk about them. And then I wrote it for believers who are not struggling, but who want to understand what others are struggling with and want to be able to provide them with solid answers. So those were the two audiences. And then in the back of the book, we have various links. We even we have a, a, a website that people can go to that we'll keep updating with lots and lots of resources. You want to dig deeper, you want to read more, you want to go further, here, here are recommended places to go. Yeah, very good, very good. Well, now, I said a few minutes ago that we'd return to this heart-mind relationship, and, and I want to ask you about something you do in Chapter 1, where you're just sort of laying the foundation, setting the stage. Because in that chapter, you you sort of wonder aloud about what might explain the difference between somebody like you, on the one hand, who studies the Bible in a critical environment where your faith is challenged for years and years, and as a result, your faith only ends up stronger, and someone else, on the other hand, who's lost their faith after studying the Bible for years among fellow believers. And you propose, I think, that perhaps, at least in some cases, it's because for many who leave the faith, it's like what it's like how Chesterton, Chesterton put it, the Christian ideal has been found difficult and left untried. Uh, to put it another way, perhaps they've merely studied the Bible intellectually and not participated in what you describe as a beautiful continuous loop that involves the heart and not merely the mind. So can you unpack that a little bit more for us? Yes, uh, for sure. So I, I don't judge individuals. In other words, I don't, I don't sit back and say, well, there must be a secret sin in your life, or you never really were born again, or you're just looking for a way out. No, I'm, I'm not going to do that. If they tell me explicitly, if it comes up, that's fine. But I want to take them at their word and meet them where they are on their journey. What struck me, though, as I, as I probed a number of people that would be called ex-evangelical, uh, some of them just hurting some of them now identify as agnostic, some of them aggressively atheistic. As I interacted with them and pressed and said, okay, tell me about the experience you had with God, the walk you had with God, the relationship you had with God when you used to believe. In other words, you, know, you may not look at it as real now, but what did it feel like then? What was it like then? Uh, as mm. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 13, 14 about our communion with the Holy Spirit. Tell me about that, that intimate relationship you had with God. And even though you may not say it's miraculous now, tell me something that happened back then when, when you considered yourself a believer that could only be attributed to God's miraculous power. That's how it looked to you then. You may have a different interpretation now. And remarkably, person after person that I talked to, not without exception, but almost without exception, could not describe anything in their lives, in, in their, quote, saved years, that was miraculous. Yeah. Or, or that was supernatural divine intervention. So you realize how, uh, you wonder how deep were the roots. Uh, Leonard Gravenhill, famous author of Why Revival Tarries and a very close friend of mine the last five years of his life, he used to say a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. So a, a being born again, being saved from sin, being given eternal life, receiving the deposit of the Holy Spirit, having God as our Father and Jesus as our friend and the Holy Spirit as the one we commune with, these are things we experience. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the many promises that God has given in the Word, as we cry out to Him, we should have some evidence, whether we're charismatic or not. We should have evidence in our lives of the hand of God, of the resurrection of Jesus. And if we don't, and now we get bombarded with these arguments, how deep are our, our, our roots? You know, look, it's, it's like if, if you've been married to someone, a wonderful, glorious, beautiful relationship for, for dozens of years, and then something comes up that raises a slight suspicion. You know, someone says, well, I think they've been unfaithful to you. It's like, they're the, no, this is I know them. We're, we've been together for dozens of years. Whereas if you first met the person, you didn't really know them that well. Well, who knows, you know? So when you've really walked with God, there's a solid foundation. And again, I'm, I'm not judging others. I can only say when I ask them questions, I was surprised to hear the answer, or, or I should say the lack of answer. And, mm. and that comes back to now other issues about, are we really bringing people into a saving knowledge of Jesus or just having them repeat a little prayer? Are we really helping people become genuine disciples of Jesus? 
By the time I was saved a year, I had a light high school schedule. I was in a church that really emphasized spiritual devotion. I spent six or seven hours alone with God every day just in the word and prayer. And I mean reading the Bible. I don't mean reading commentaries. I mean reading the Bible, memorizing scripture, and praying six to seven hours every day and did that without fail for months. I mean deep roots were put down at that time, getting the word, my heart, my mind, and cultivating intimacy with God. And for sure, when you have that, now questions come up. Okay, they're legitimate questions. They're, they're questions from smart people. They're, they're questions raised by atheists that are penetrating questions, questions mm. raised by biblical critics that, that are, are strong questions. You don't deny the, the power of the question, but you, you now have a foundation with which you, you come to answer. It's not just by yourself. It's like saying, okay, God, I know you're real, but I don't know how it lines up with this and this, and I'm really struggling. And then together you get answers. Yeah, yeah, very well said. Well, as you know, our show here is Rethinking Hell Live, and I want to dig in a moment to your chapter devoted to the topic of hell. But in order to sort of tease viewers into uh, a greater interest in, in the broader topics of your book, give us a, a few examples of some of the other issues that you discuss in the book, and then we'll start talking about hell. Yeah, so I'll do that briefly in, in keeping with the focus of your podcast. Uh, <laughs> I deal with the issue of atheists and agnostics and how writings that became very popular 15 years ago, and et cetera, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Bart Ehrman, different ones. So in one case, a, a, a former evangelical, now agnostic, you know, best-selling author, New Testament scholar, the others, outspoken atheist, et cetera. These books became bestsellers, and a lot of their objections have trickled down, trickled down through memes, trickled down through popular arguments. So that Josh McDowell has said that that arguments used to run into with college-age students, he's now running into with kids who are 12 or 13. Uh, my friend Daryl Bach, professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, likes to say that in the past, we used to be able to tell people, well, it's true because it's in the Bible. Now we have to tell them it's in the Bible because it's true. So those foundations have been eroded. The shift in the culture where there's now the celebration of everything LGBTQ, and young people grow up with a sense of solidarity that, that it's the right thing to defend their gay friend or their trans friend. So if, if gay is good, Christianity is bad. So the cultural shift has driven many people away from the faith. Uh, a, another shift uh, or thing that's happened is, is more and more scandals in the church. So, so not just the terrible examples of sexual abuse that get covered up within the local church, that, that's horrific enough, but I'm talking about on the broad scale well-known leaders from all different backgrounds and all different camps falling into sin, that brings a lot of question with it, a lot of skepticism with it. Um, another thing is the, the ongoing question of suffering and the goodness mm -hmm. of God, hence the, the chapter on hell. And then uh, the, the weak gospel messages, the, the watered-down gospel messages, even the counterfeit gospel messages, what kind of fruit do they produce? And then one of the things Jesus spoke about, because iniquity will abound, the love of many will wax cold, the ubiquitous nature of porn, the ubiquitous nature of other things, endless distractions. So we're dealing with things that no other generation has ever had to deal with, and all out of salt, and in many cases the foundations are not ready to withstand those. So those are some of the other things that we deal with in why so many Christians have left the faith. Yeah, very good. Yeah, and I hope people will uh, get their hands on a copy and check out those chapters. I think they're helpful. But um, let's turn now to the topic of hell specifically. And I just want to start by asking, what's been your personal experience in ministry and in apologetics when facing objections having to do with hell? Is is hell often a hurdle that has to be overcome in your discussions with unbelievers? Uh, it, on the one hand, uh, over the decades, I would say in the earlier years, perhaps I was hearing it more, but it all depends on, you know, what was being preached, what was being heard. You know, I, I think there were more preachers nationally talking about hellfire and burning forever, and therefore it was more of a topic. You, you don't hear it preached as much, therefore not as many people would be raising it. But certainly in my interaction with rabbis in the Jewish community, uh, that would be used as a tool against us. And, mm. and, you know, and, and of course, in Dante's Inferno type terms, 
uh, you know, I remember being on Donahue when so he's famous talk show host and then came back on the air some years later. This is, I don't know, maybe around 2004, 2005, something like that. And I was on his show and I was on with Rabbi Shmuley, so Orthodox Jewish friend of mine, and Dr. Al Mohler was on. And, and of course, Shmuley, you know, references the eternal barbecue. And, and there'd be Jewish polemicists attacking our faith who would say that, you know, as bad as the Inquisitions were, as bad as Hitler is, this is much worse, etc. So it's, it's, it's been used. And then among believers, honestly, Chris, I don't think most people really think about it. Mm. I preached a message in the early 1980s, four things that most Christians don't believe. And, and they were basically, we don't really believe in God. We don't really believe in heaven. We don't really believe in hell. You know, if, if we really believe these things, we would live differently. So I think for many Christians, it's something they talk about, but don't really think about. Otherwise, they would live very, very differently. Yeah, I think that you're probably right about that. Now, you start your chapter on hell by challenging the notion that I think some people have, that the God of Scripture just absolutely delights in punishing people, is just absolutely thrilled to do it at every opportunity. Um, is that the picture that you see the biblical authors paint of God, or, or do you see something a little different? No, I, I I see throughout Scripture an overwhelming emphasis on the goodness, kindness, love, mercy, and justice of God. His justice is fearful. His justice is dreadful. The reason you see the constant outpouring of judgments is not because it makes God happy, but because we're so sinful. It mm -hmm. is the right thing to do. Look, if if suddenly uh, we had a plague of of terrorists attacking our neighborhoods and trying to kill as many as they could, and the army came in and was able to take them out and kill them, well, all the corpses all around are, are not because we love seeing people die, but because people are trying to kill us. This is the right thing to do to take them out. Um, you do have one statement in Deuteronomy 28, but it's clearly hyperbole, where God says, just as he rejoiced to bless uh, Israel, so he will rejoice to destroy uh, it, it's clearly hyperbolic language. How do I know it? Because in the rest of Scripture, God speaks of his grief over his people's pain. He says in Isaiah 63 that in all their affliction, he too was afflicted. Genesis 6, God grieves that he made man because of the wickedness of, of humankind. Uh, he says in, 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 in Jeremiah that as often as he rebuked Ephraim, his heart went out to him. So Certainly, God delights. What does it say at the end of Micah 7? He delights in showing mercy. He, he doesn't hold on to his anger forever. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 23, How often I long to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you weren't willing. So God's not conflicted when he brings judgment. He brings judgment because it is deserved, and everything he does is perfect. But it's not like this sadistic view that he's just laughing and turn him over on the other side for another billion years and roast him. Ha, 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 ha. Right. And, that, and that we as believers should be laughing and rejoicing along with that. So that's a, that's a very ugly, wrong picture of the God of the Bible. Now, of course, so much of our preaching today just makes him like a toothless grandfather, you know, <laughs> or, or, or as, as A.W. Tozer said decades ago, Jesus standing outside the door, hat in hand, hoping that we'll open the door and let him in. I mean, no, we, he is Lord, and we are accountable to him, and there's no conflict in who he is and what he does, and if we reject his mercy, he will rightly punish us. But there's a very wrong view of God that people have when it comes to hell, and I felt it was really important. I, I prayed about this, Chris. How do I address this? What's the right approach? And I really felt first thing was to bombard people with what the Scripture says about the nature and character of the God who is love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you did so very well. There's one, one of the uh, biblical citations that you point to is Ezekiel um, speaking for God, saying, I, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone or the death of the wicked. There's a couple of places mm -hmm. in Ezekiel where he says that. And 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 that leads me to want to go on a, just a little bit of a tangent for a moment, uh, because you, you don't cover this in your book, but it raises in my mind um, an interesting question around what's been called the problem of heavenly grief. So here's what I mean by that. One of the objections um, to Christianity based on, or, or actually one of the objections to a doctrine of hell as eternal torment goes something like this. How could I, as somebody who's saved, enjoy the bliss of heaven forever knowing that my lost loved ones are suffering in hell? 
Now, one of the answers that uh, I gave when I still believed in eternal torment and that a lot of people who believe in eternal torment give is that when we are resurrected and we're glorified, we're going to be made like God. We're going to we're going to our character is going to be perfected. We'll see things from his perspective. And so we'll 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 see the justice and the appropriateness of our loved one's punishment in hell. And so it's not going to interrupt our heavenly bliss. But these texts that you uh, go to lengths to list at the beginning of your chapter, including that one from Ezekiel, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, suggest to me that if we are made like God when we're resurrected and glorified, then we wouldn't take pleasure in the punishing of our lost loved ones in hell either. But by contrast, and here's I'm curious to know what you make of this argument, um, even though it's off the topic of your book a bit. It seems to me that if our lost loved ones were finally to perish forever, um, then yes, we and God himself are going to grieve and mourn the loss of these people who wouldn't bend the knee, but we'd be able to move on and eventually enjoy the bliss of heaven forever. And I can say as somebody who's lost loved ones that it is it is a fairly common occurrence to mourn and grieve, but eventually move on. So I'm curious, do, do you see any merit to an argument like that, or, or, or how might you respond? to the problem of heavenly grief honestly you could come at that either way you could use it for the argument of eternal punishment or for the argument of ultimate destruction and by the way we can go as far from the topic of my book as you want <laughs> and focus that that's fine i mean i'm, I'm on your podcast uh, uh rethinking hell so uh, let, let me say a few things briefly and we can interact on this yeah. one is that in our private interaction recently you told me that you find the idea of ultimate destruction more fearful than the idea of, of eternal eternal punishing, right? I do. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So if that was the case, then just knowing that that had happened to a loved one, how am I going to move on from that? You know, so I could make the argument that simply the fact that I know that they're not with me forever, that they could have been with me, that they forfeited this forever, that that would cause me pain forever the same way. Uh, and and I'll, I'll obviously let you respond, but okay. the other side is, in my view, uh, while there is merit in that argument from our perspective here on this earth, and I'm not ad uh, saying this as an aggressive advocate of eternal conscious torment, as you know, but rather, I don't know that when God is carrying out acts of judgment, okay, he, he, he may grieve that he has to do certain things but when he does them, I don't believe there's any conflict in him in doing it because it's it's the right thing to do and it's what justice requires. Hence the hyperbolic language of that he'll rejoice in doing it, right? So I believe on that day that when we stand before him that everything will make perfect sense to us. Why human beings suffered as they did in this world, why there was so much pain, and if there is eternal, eternal conscious torment, it'll make perfect sense to us and may, while there may be a momentary grief, you know, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So in my mind, either one would make equal sense forever and ever and ever, because in the presence of God, the perfect justice will be seen. Okay, that, that's fair. And and yeah, I don't intend to argue at length on this. And it's as as you know, this argument isn't what convinces me anyway. It's it's right. the biblical data. But right. Um. But but uh, since you mentioned your impression that it's it's six in one hand, half dozen in the other, um, I'm not sure that's where my intuitions go. And it doesn't mean that that you're wrong and I'm right. But you know, for me, it's not a question of whether final punishment will make sense in the minds of those of us who were redeemed. The question is, to what extent will the knowledge that our loved ones are perpetually suffering, in whatever form of suffering that is, how will that knowledge impact my ability to enjoy the bliss of the community of God and 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 and, and a perfectly restored cosmos and everything? How, how would my enjoyment of that be affected by the knowledge that my lost loved ones are suffering, even if justly? So I imagine, for example, that, you know, uh, if I have a loved one that I know has been sentenced to life in prison um, for something, uh, and, and let's say like it's a really violent crime or something. So they're sent to high security prison where they're, you know, it's a real rough time. Um, well, 
it's going to be difficult for me, even if I think there's they're suffering justly. If I if I know that they are suffering, that is going to impact at least at times um, my day to day life. Merely the knowledge, even though I know that they're being punished justly. Whereas if somebody were to go out and commit a bunch of crimes that were that merited the death penalty, and if they were executed finally, I would grieve and I would mourn that. But eventually, that would no longer affect my my day-to-day life in the sense of interfering with my ability to enjoy the daily beauties of life. And so for me, it just kind of seems intuitive that it's it makes sense that one could move on after one has grieved the just loss of a loved one. But it's quite another thing, it seems to me, to be able to um, not have one's joy interrupted with the knowledge that one's lost loved one is suffering. Ah, if that so makes you sense. Made a, you made a massive assumption there. Okay. That we're going to know forever about the fate of the lost or the wicked. Now, think, think of this for a minute. There's so much that we don't understand about the world to come and eternal life. For example, let's say there's a husband and a wife, right? And, and believers and the husband is unfaithful. He commits adultery with another gal in the church. They repent, they end up going to other churches. Now, you know, they, they're all saved together, right? But there was a chunk in their lives that really interacted heavily and wrongly. Well, when they see each other forever, the world to come, there's not going to be guilt about adultery, even thought of it, right? Or, or when Jesus tells the, the Sadducees about the woman whose husband dies and, you know, married seven men. Okay, well, in eternity, you know, when, which is going to be, is there going to be no different relationship with someone you were married to versus someone you weren't married to or an aborted baby? What happens to, you know, at what state of development is an aborted baby in the world to come? Does it grow up a certain way or how do these things work? Or, I mean, endless questions. I'm just raising a few endless sure. questions that, that we have no answer to. So we're making an assumption that we can't make. And, and it raises all, all sorts of philosophical arguments. So to me, if, if, I, if I want to take your position of annihilation, 99% of it is just going to be what does scripture say? Yeah, agreed. And then then you could argue about which is in keeping with the character of God in terms of the nature of punishment that's uh, uh, dished out and things like that. But we just don't know. You know, there's the Jonathan Edwards view that that gazing on the, the fate of the wicked will bring us joy because it's a demonstration of the justice of God. And many would say to us, look, Chris, just you know, you guys just don't have a sufficient recognition of human wickedness. You've downplayed it. And the degree of rebellion against it is uh, rebellion against God that it is, and the outrage that it is, and that's why in the Book of Revelation, when Babylon's destroyed, God's people shout hallelujah. You know that's a good thing. They they rejoice in that day, and we should rejoice as as well. Um, so you know there's there's that comeback, and, and again, it's your view as well. The the better argument is based on Scripture as opposed to based on that intellectual argument. I I do have a question though. I wanted to, to yeah. ask just to follow up. Okay, so. You can tell me about people whose faith was strengthened once they concluded that there was not eternal conscious torment because it always it troubled them. How could this be? Because they wrestled with it. They really thought about it, right? How could this be? And then when they realized that annihilation was real, it was very freeing for them. Or I even had people call my radio show, maybe around the time of, of my interview with, with, uh, with Dr. Fudge, uh, about this. And they said it freed them to witness more. Uh, b- because this thing wasn't hanging over their heads. And obviously in my chapter, I bring in the, the possibility of annihilation to say there's another way to look at this. If this is your whole issue here, eternal conscious torment, here's another way to look at scripture. But my question for you was, if in your view, final annihilation is a fate even worse than eternal conscious torment, mm-hmm. then shouldn't it go the other way? Shouldn't it be that once people realize annihilation is true, it's even more dreadful and even scarier for them and harder to believe? Well, so number one, not everybody shares my convictions. Um, right. <laughs> amongst amongst annihilationists, I would say that most of them uh, would share probably your intuition that the more severe penalty would be eternal torment. Um, but there is a small contingent of us that, that think the other way around. And I think what we would say is there's a difference between what is objectively worse um, and what is um, subjectively more 
um, uh, painful. So, for example, you know, in, in terms of objectivity, um, some of us within the conditionalist community uh, identify to some degree as classical theists. And as classical theists, we, we sort of take this Augustinian view that um, that pure being is pure perfection. And the, and the more and more you are less than perfect, the, more, the less and less being you actually have. Uh, it's sort of like how dark isn't a, darkness isn't a thing. It's the absence of a thing, right? So on this scale of objective good, um, pure, perfect, unmitigated being is the best. And then the worse and worse and worse and worse things get, uh, the less and less being you have until the point where you have no being at all, which is the worst possible fate. So that's what we're talking about in terms of objectivity. But mm -hmm. in terms of subjectivity, even if um, the death penalty is a more severe uh, pe uh, fate than, say, being in prison for life, which is, by the way, not an uh, intuition everybody shares, but it is one I think most of us do. Most people think life in prison is more merciful than um, the electric chair, for example. But um, – but but and if we see that if if we think the death penalty is worse, it's still nevertheless the case that somebody who is in prison miserable and is going to be miserable for a much longer period of time. There's an emotional um, aspect to that that isn't the case ten years after somebody has died, and so from a subjective perspective, there's still this ongoing experience of misery, of separation, of whatever. Um, that even though it's objectively less severe, could be for some people subjectively more severe. And I think that's why there are people, even if they do share my intuition that annihilation is a more severe fate, who nevertheless are able to worship God more fully and freely when they become per persuaded by this view, because even if it's objectively more worse, and of course that's a big if, but even if it's objectively more worse, sub subjectively um, people will undergo far less, infinitely less, uh, pain and misery and sadness. Um, I don't know if that helps at all, but that would be my answer. Okay, to that yeah, question. again, just uh, it wasn't my argument. It was responding to, to some of your thought. Of course, sure. the difference is that life in prison, you still die at a certain point. Of course. Right. Where, so so there, it, it's not an exact parallel to a final no, annihilation. And of course, you know, C.S. Lewis in his great divorce talking about the, the fate of the lost does seem to paint a picture of this loss of humanity. And, and loss of selfhood, so you continue to degenerate. So, you know, that's always been a question as well in terms of, of what that looks like, you know, what that final experience is, is sure. like. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, um, back, back it, to you. You lead the way from here. Sorry. Yeah, no, it, it's it's really good. Um, and there was something else I was going to add, but I, I, I might have forgotten. Um, nah, oh well. Yeah, I, I think uh, my, my big reason for um, – uh, addressing the which is more severe option isn't because I think it actually matters. I don't think it does. Ultimately, I think it, it, for the most part, it's going to boil down to a subjective per perception of which is worse. But the reason why it is something that I will talk about sometimes is because very often that is an argument that the eternal torment side will pose to us is that um, if 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 unbelievers think that what awaits them is just being destroyed forever, they're, they're not, it's not scary enough. It's not severe enough. People aren't going to turn to Christ. And all I'm trying to say is that you, you, the, one of the many dangers of using a utilitarian reasoning like that to determine what's true is the fact that different people you evangelize will will think differently from one another. And for some of them, like me, eternal torment will not be as scary as annihilation. So anyway, that's all. Yeah, so one, one interesting question, just on the utilitarian yeah. end of things. So, uh, and, and for those that don't know my own history here, uh, because I was so immersed in scripture and not reading a lot of other books and subject to a lot of other influences, my first couple of years in the Lord, uh, I used to memorize, it did for over six months, 20 verses every day. And, and, uh, you know, to this day, I can quote so many still out of the King James where I memorize them, read the word at least two hours a day, memorize scripture one hour a day. And if you raised an issue to me, uh, why do I believe this, this, this? I would, you know, rapid fire give you all my scriptures, right? So one day I was I was driving in my car. I'd been saved a couple of years, maybe read the Bible cover to cover four or five times at that point, memorized probably more than 4,000 verses. And I heard a Seventh-day Adventist teacher go through the teaching about being cut off, being destroyed, uh, etc., et people perishing. And when he went through the verses, I said, that's... 
that's a possible reading of scripture. Now, you still had Matthew 25, 46 and other verses and, and, and Luke 16 and what that would imply and various things like that about the soul living on after the body, etc. But when he went through all of them, this, this did not violate my grid of impossibility, etc. Mm-hmm. And then wrestling with the issue when, when my father died suddenly in, in 1977, when I was just uh, what, uh, 21, 22 years old, you know, really trying to wrestle with this on an honest intellectual and spiritual level. What I, what I decided many years ago was I'm going to quote scripture because scriptures are so strong and the warnings are so strong and the warnings are so dreadful. And whatever we're talking about is of eternal consequence that when I preach, I'm going to quote scripture and not embellish. So with all respect to Jonathan Edwards and sinners in the hands of an angry God, I'm not going to paint that picture, but simply quote scripture and let the word interpret itself. Now I know for many, the moment they hear those scriptures, they'll immediately think eternal conscious torment, et cetera. Others will hear it differently, but that's where I landed. And what I felt more to do over the years, because I I don't want to minimize the the judgment to come. I don't want to minimize the horrific nature of the fate of, of, of those that reject God's mercy. And honestly, for, for many, it could even be for me, the idea of final annihilation, it's like, okay, as long as it's not torment forever and ever and ever, it's bad, but it's not that bad. You know, th- there could be that little loophole. I, I, I've been very careful to, to not minimize the urgency of our burden and to not minimize how people have gone to the ends of the earth. I think of people going into the Buddhist world where Buddhists look for some type of ultimate nirvana, which on a certain level is the cessation of existence and they came running to hear more because they heard of an endless hell. They wanted to escape from it. I've, I've not wanted to minimize that, but I felt, okay, listen, especially in dealing with a, a Jewish debate and public debate where hell is just going to be used like to smash people over the head with the evil of our God, is to say there are different ways of looking at Scripture. It's sobering either way. There's a great commission and a great burden either way. But let's look at these. So in in my chapter in the book, I do lay out, okay, here's the case, in short, for final annihilation. Very here's short. The, <laughs> yeah, yes, well, it's short both ways, because so. my, my, my main emphasis, and it's short to say, here's how it, it could be understandable at this eternal conscious torment. My main emphasis is on the nature and character of God in the chapter. But I feel it's important at least to put this on the table and talking with people whose big objection to the goodness of God or the Bible is the eternal nature of hell. Let's say there are different ways of looking at this. It's still, it's still dreadfully serious and of eternal consequence, but it, it may not be this Dante's Inferno thing that you have in your mind. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I agree. I think you were said you were going to ask me a question about utilitarianism. Yeah, so, so come back then. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for yeah. staying with it. So, <laughs> uh, okay, I was talking to a, an old theologian uh, you know, great, great uh, theological scholar and, and charismatic believer as well. And he's very strong on eternal conscious torment. And he, and he said, you know, no one had, comes running to the altar to escape a final annihilation. They come running to the altar to escape uh, eternal hell. Now you could say, well, that's just emotional. What, what does that prove? That's, well, and it's also just... verifiably false, but we'll right, talk about so, that in so, a second. Right. So that would be the thing I want to come back to. What, what, Obviously, a Buddhist looking forward to some type of nirvana is not looking to a fearful destruction in the sight of a holy God where all his sins are brought up before him and he realizes what he's forfeiting forever and then is destroyed. Uh, but if, if perhaps the idea of cessation of existence is not that big a deal to some, what's your utilitarian response to that? And please tell me about exceptions where people run oh, to the yeah. altar you know, because of the threat of final annihilation. And this not to, this not to debate. This is for information, as you know. Yeah, I know. I appreciate that. Uh, as to the, the the verifiably false claim that I made, um, look up Mark Bauerlein, for example. He was an English teacher who a few years ago um, uh, published a, a, an article, sort of a biographical article, uh, about his conversion to Christianity. And his reason, his driving motivator for converting to Christianity was what he called the nothingness that he spied in the bush. Meaning when he looked at the world around him and, and the fate that he thought as an atheist that he was eventually 
actually headed toward of just nothingness of not being there. It, kept him up at night. It terrified him and it mm. motivated him to turn to Christ. Uh, also, very recently, just in the past few months, there's a woman that, um, unbelievable, the the radio program and magazine mm -hmm. in, in London, um, there's a, a a woman that they did an article on who also, as an atheist, was extremely terrified of death because she thought that it would end her existence. And she turned to Christ and finds uh, comfort now knowing that her life isn't going to end uh, finally and forever. So there there are examples like those of people that turn to Christ specifically because they're terrified of death as annihilation. But that having been said, I, I don't I don't think in terms of utility, uh, rightly or wrongly. Mm -hmm. And my I think that what I do, what I would do when I'm asked about the nature of hell um, in, in the, the, the average context is do the very same thing that you're doing, which is, number one, focus on the biblical terminology, and then number two, um, lay out a, a, a range of options that Christians, that represent Christian thinking over the centuries, and say this is an ongoing, lively debate, and ultimately you're going to have to come to your own conclusions based on what you see Scripture teaching. And I have absolutely no problem with that. In fact, whoops, in fact, um, I have a problem with churches who will include uh, annihilationism specifically as one of their statements uh, among their statement of faith, um, to the same extent that I would oppose a church including eternal torment as part of their statement of faith. Um, it, it seems that that's a topic over which we can disagree lovingly and agreeably, focusing on scripture together and letting it dictate our convictions, even if in the end we don't agree. Yeah, there was um, one seminary I was asked to teach at once because I've, I've been a visiting professor, adjunct professor at seven or eight different schools over the years, you know, leading seminaries. And, and one was very, very specific in their doctrinal statement, very, very specific in detail about eternal conscious torment, om almost in a way that I would say, you know, you had to agree on the temperature of hell. I mean, I was shocked by how specific <laughs> it was. And of course, I, I couldn't say that I affirm that because of the question of certain level of, of, of ambiguity. The terror is there. The overwhelming nature of it is there. That's, that's indisputable. The eternal consequences. Um, but I, I couldn't just say, yeah, I affirm that and, and absolutely sign on the dotted line. Uh, I, I had to say, I'll let, I'll let scripture speak for itself on that. There was another seminary where, aside from the interview I did with different professors, where we went through various issues, they wanted to probe with me, what do I believe about authorship of this book or historicity of this, etc. But their statement relied on a larger evangelical statement that the fate of the of the believer would be eternal life and the fate of the non-believer eternal death. And I thought that's that's really a good way of saying it. It it conveys a picture in, in which both views can 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 fit in terms of being under the pale of orthodoxy, but does speak of something utterly dreadful. Yeah. And my wife Nancy. We've been married 47 years now. When we met at the age of 19, she was a hardcore atheist, also Jewish, but a hardcore atheist, and had been an atheist since she was at least eight. So to this day, she'll help me understand an atheist mindset better than I can, because with all the struggles I had, all the challenges from the Jewish community and critical scholars, I never struggled really with the existence of God. So she's helped me with that, but she, she said for sure as an atheist, an atheist that, that she knew and believes is still widespread, just this ultimate terror of death because you don't exist anymore and that's it. And all you have is your existence and, and it's going to be gone as opposed to, hey, I, I just had, I had a kidney stone issue. So I had to have general anesthesia where they blasted this kidney stone out. So, you know, you close your eyes. And now you next thing you wake up, you don't have any memory or anything. Well, some people just close their eyes and never wake up. Well, that's not how it strikes people. It strikes mm. people many with so, some. It's like that. Hey, I go. I close my eyes, and that's it. Others, there's a dread with it. But but the biblical picture is not just death. It's standing before God and yeah. being judged for our sins. And and it, with all respect to Dr. Fudge, the question that I think people weren't totally satisfied with his answer, because I, I pressed again, wanted to get information. So everyone's going to be judged according to their works. Right. And there will be a different punishment for an Adolf Hitler than than for someone that was your decent average person, but lost, rejected the gospel. Right, still a sinner, still lost. So we understand that. So maybe one person suffers longer than another, but then is finally extinguished or annihilated. 
And I asked the question, which I'll ask you, yeah. if someone, in fact, let's say that scenario is right, that somehow the severity of the punishment is, is meted out differently. Of course, mm-hmm. that raises the same question for those who believe in eternal conscious torment. So you suffer sure. forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, not just not quite as badly as someone else, you know, slight comfort, right? Uh, but if there is terrible suffering and then it, it, judge for our sins, but then it ends with final annihilation, isn't that almost like a release or a relief from the punishment? H- how would you respond if someone raised that to you? Yeah, well, first of all, I do think that um, if one thinks that people will suffer in hell for a very long, protracted period of time and then be annihilated, yeah, I think I agree. That would come. That would be that would be perceived as some kind of a, a, a mercy to such people. Now, of course, as soon as they no longer exist, will they won't experience anything, including right. relief. So when people say it's a relief, I think that's logically in, inaccurate because they won't experience anything relief. They, they won't experience anything at all. But Got my it. intuition is that, yes, that still does seem something of a mercy. But, but Edward Fudge never explicitly said that he believed anybody would suffer for a very long protracted period of time. And I don't think so. All he said was that the, the means by which God might finally exact final punishment in the form of capital punishment um, allows for all sorts of combinations of duration and also intensity and type of suffering. And he proposed that perhaps that infinite number of possible combinations of duration, type, and intensity city of suffering could account for degrees of punishment in hell. Um, and I think that's a legitimate answer, even if it's not completely satisfying. I also, though, will say I don't think it's any less satisfying than the answer that believers in eternal torment have to give, which is, well, varying degrees of suffering. Because I'll tell you what, the idea of being burned physically by fire for a very long period of time um, is absolutely terrifying. But uh, what I can say is that when you're in the midst of extremely intense physical pain, you don't have the mental faculties to experience a great deal of psychological misery, psychological pain. So if the physical pain is reduced, you're now going to be able to experience more psychological. So which one is worse? You know, I, I'm not sure that there's a yeah. really great satisfying answer there. Yeah, and, and but, I understand philosophically that these questions will come up, and they're legitimate. I mean, we're, we're talking about the fate of, of fellow human beings, but from from taking your side of the aisle Mm -hmm. i i really think that christians must be pressed with what they really believe and challenged as do you really believe it that does the is the god that uh, like for example i had a seventh day adventist friend and we would spar all all the time he's also jewish you know there's seventh day adventists that uh, some you'd say seem to be genuine believers and others clearly just cult-like etc as far as I could tell, he was a genuine believer, but we would spar all the time. And I was tutoring him in some advanced Hebrew stuff, but we would spar all the time. But he had a little track. It was about the most evil man who ever lived. And was it Hitler? Was it Stalin? Was it Mao? It's like, no, it's Jesus, because he's going to torture people forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, uh. you know, according to you. And so, I mean, we'd spar back and forth. Um, I know Christians can simply say, hey, whatever God does is right and true. But ask yourself if you really genuinely believe that people that you love uh, that don't know the Lord will suffer consciously, not just for moments, months, years, but forever and ever and ever. And and there's no end. There's no way out possibly. The reason this is a a little more real to me, as strange as this is going to sound, Chris, but when I was not saved— and my friends were not quite born again yet, but hearing the gospel more and more, and of course, hearing about the book of Revelation and end time prophecy and hell and all, you know, it's just the stuff they were hearing in the church. And they talked to me about it. And now we're using drugs on top of all this because they're not <laughs> saved yet. Yeah. And I have, in the midst of a drug stupor, an out of body experience where suddenly I realize I'm lost forever. I mean, it wasn't a biblical picture of hell, but I was, I'm alone. It's forever, and there's no way out. And the absolute, dre- I mean, the the dread that overtook me. And when I when I came out of the stupor, realized, I, I mean, I I was shattered. And it just it gave me a little glimpse. Every so often over the years, I would meditatively get that glimpse and that thought of the reality of eternal conscious torment. And 
you know, the only thing you could do is say, I have to spend every second of the rest of my life trying to win as many lost people as I can. And I can barely even sleep because the burden is so overwhelming, as opposed to, you know, talking to this one seminary professor when he was pushing me on, on you know, details of eternal conscious torment. I said to him, you must have several prayer meetings a week at your seminary <laughs> with tears and weeping over this and agony. And he said, well, it's not for you to interview me here. Uh, obviously, the answer was no, we don't. You know, so that to me is a terrible inconsistency. And, mm. and, and you have to say, can, can I reconcile that with the nature of the God that I believe in? You know, I, I think that's something that we just kind of we talk about. We talk about hellfire, but we really don't believe it. I'd also ask, turning the tables, those that would say, hey, no, there is absolutely final annihilation. You know, God will destroy body and soul in hell. Does the other dreadfulness of that, the, the, the depth of warnings that Scripture speaks of, um, the, the eternal fire, the images of weeping and gnashing of teeth and outer darkness and cast into the lake of fire, ha have we in any way lessened the severity of that if we hold to final annihilation because it, it gave us an emotional outlet from eternal conscious torment. So I think serious questions need to be asked each way. I know in your case, you'll say, no, no, you know, you hold to the severity of it. Your friends hold to the severity of it. So I'm, I'm not raising a charge. True, I'm true. simply saying, let's, let's ask honest questions to ourselves. And it's because of that certain holy tension that I feel is important um, that I've, and, and the scriptural arguments that can be raised that I have just said, well, here's what the word says, and it's very intense, and take hold of the intensity of it. Don't downplay it with, without trying to argue aggressively for either position. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think that's you put that very well, and that's what I would encourage people to do as well. Um, now, you you mentioned uh, annihilationism. You actually gave a few paragraphs to it toward the end of the chapter, um, and you don't explicitly endorse it. But one of the things that really impresses uh, impresses a lot of us uh, annihilationists who read your read this book is that you do. Um, offer a brief but sufficient, I think, rebuttal to um, challenges to annihilationism from texts like Matthew 25, 46 and Daniel 12, too. Do, do you want to speak for a moment about why you think those verses um, are, do seem to you to be at least consistent with annihilationism, sure. if it turns out to be true? Right. So I, I, even in public debates, when challenged by rabbis, I've said there are other, or debate with agnostic like Bart Ehrman, you know, to say, hey, there, there are different ways of looking at scripture that that have full integrity behind them and some level uh, through church history as, as well some level of, of of reference but okay so num number one when you're developing a doctrine you want to look at the overwhelming testimony of scripture consistently mm. and see if it goes in a certain direction then if it does if you have two or five verses handful of verses that seem to say something different you don't now try to fit those into the larger. You ask, okay, how does this? How do I understand these? But you you base your doctrine on the overwhelming, consistent statement. So mm -hmm. when when you step back and look at it, as annihilationists would argue, and you know John mm -hmm. Wenham I think says it's ninety nine percent of scriptural testimony does speak of the wicked being cut off, the wicked being no more. Now obviously a lot of the emphasis was in this world. But then you just think John 3, 16, whoever does, who believes will not perish, but have eternal life. And the contrast is between life and perishing or resurrected to eternal life and eternal damnation. So uh, God destroys, we said, body and soul in hell. Uh, the very nature of fires that it burns, burns things up, etc. So to me, the I agree that the overwhelming testimony, the, the overwhelming bulk of scriptures do speak of, of death, of final destruction, of cutting off, of being no more, right? So you start there. You say, okay, but you clearly have a Luke 16 and other passages that indicate life after death. So there's some type of, of hell, some type of heaven before the final judgment where the soul lives on. And you do have, you know, tormented day and night forever and ever in the book of Revelation. Even if it's about Satan and angels, you still have that reference then you have Matthew 25, 46, contrasting eternal life as eternal punishment. And then Daniel 12, 2, contrasting eternal life is, is eternal reproach. But uh, again, 
Daniel 12, 2 could simply mean that the wicked will be judged and their memory, that there, there will be a, a legacy of, of disaster, destruction. And that's very common in the Old Testament. What, what is the legacy? What is the, the memory of this person? It, it is reproach. It is terrible. Uh, that's one thing. And then Matthew 25, 46, that it is a punishment that lasts forever. It's in contrast with eternal life. They are eternally punished with what? Second Thessalonians 1, everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Now, some have said, yeah, but that very verse, everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, means that they are ongoingly destroyed. I understand that. But the word destruction does seem to speak against that. So, uh, and I do know in the first century that there were Jewish teachings of eternal fire torment, and that would have been in the minds of Jewish hearers. So when they heard Jesus speak, what were they thinking? That's, that's a valid point to raise. But there definitely are other legitimate ways to read these verses. I remember, you know, dealing with Jehovah's Witness. I saw an absolute cult decades ago. And they said, yeah, it doesn't say eternal punishing. It says eternal punishment. And I like, aha, what a stupid argument pushed it away because of all the other heresies that they held to. But that argument can be raised separated from Jehovah's Witnesses and their heresies. That is an argument that can be raised, that it's the punishment that lasts forever. So when I teach, I say there are three things that are absolutely clear, that the, the eternal fate of those who reject the Lord, it is irreversible. So you can't fix it on that day. You can't call for an a, a appeal, uh, call an attorney in to plead your case, get a second chance. It's irreversible. It is dreadful. We, we, we need to, to not use the images of Scripture to argue against eternal punishment or a punishing, but use the images of Scripture to bring a holy fear of what's coming. That's second. And third, it's of eternal consequence. If I emphasize those three things, I believe I'm being faithful to Scripture, I'm not reading too much in, and I'm not minimizing the consequences of rejecting God. Yeah. Yeah, very well said. I, I will just say regarding the Jewish views during the time of Jesus, and, and you'll be more familiar with this than I am probably, you can read, for example, what the the, Sofe, the uh, Mishnah so, Sotefta, or Tosefta, what the Tosefta says, for example, and, and you see this in um, the other rabbinical writings as well, that there were uh, plenty of Jews who believed that the wicked would finally be destroyed in Gehenna. There weren't, it wasn't only belief in eternal torment, yeah. as you can probably, as you probably know. And, and if you read the Dead Sea Scrolls, it seems like they're very clearly teaching annihilation, but that's a whole other debate. Um, I, I know that we have a limited amount of time, so I have one last question for you, um, and wherever you go with this is totally fine, but um, you you might have detected that many of us in the annihilationist community really hope one day uh, that you will become convinced of our view, um, because you know right now you're either undecided or maybe you're leaning in the direction of eternal torment, whatever. The question I have for you is, what do you see as the biggest obstacles that we as the annihilationist community need to overcome to convince people like you uh, to fully embrace our view? Right. So I'm going to have to— What work is left to be done, I guess, yeah, is the yeah. question so, uh, yeah. so I So I have to throw this out and, and then not get a response just because of my time as okay. I'm looking at having to get to my radio studio. But I'm, I'm happy to you know, even have a few of you, you know, some of your friends, colleagues, we can have a joint discussion. For me, uh, put me in a different class. It's not a matter of convincing me, because almost 50 years ago, I saw the legitimacy of the argument, okay? Mm. Um, it has to be fleshed out in terms of seeing how it works on a missional level, mm. seeing over a generation of people that hold to it, how it, it filters out in evangelism and life, and never wanting to despise the fact that it was the the a view of of eternal torment that drove so many people to go to the ends of the earth to give their lives for the lost because of that very reality. So, because I've often seen it minimized, and I, and I've 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 generally seen the great missions burden and the great passion, not just out of love for Jesus and wanting everyone to have what we have, but also this burning desire, burning desire to not want to see anyone uh, suffer forever. That, that has driven people so uh, and never wanting to minimize the 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 reality of the judgment that we we face if we reject God that the, the horror of what it is so to me it, it's it's not so much intellectual or philosophical arguments it's stuff lived out 
uh, stuff on a practical level, or even just feeling the Lord saying categorically, you must take a stand in this particular yeah. way. And because the the stakes are so high, this is the kind of thing that I feel better holding in holy tension mm. uh, rather rather than uh, than just dogmatically coming down one way or another. You don't you don't want to make a mistake here for many, many reasons. So those are the bigger things. And it's been fine for me to just say, hey, what scripture says is very intense and that's enough for me. And and we can let these things work themselves out. But with that, I've got to run. But if if you want to have a round table with a few guys and we could plug, you know, plumb the depths of this more, I'm I'm open to the possibility of it. Okay. All right. I'll reach out to you. Where do where should viewers go online to find you online? Ask drbrown.org. Ask drbrown.org. Go there. Sign up for our emails. First thing, we'll get you in our, our welcome tour. Ask Dr. Brown, askdrbrown.org, or download the app, Ask Dr. Brown Ministries, Ask Dr. Brown, Ask Dr. Brown Ministries. Download the app. We have literally thousands of hours of free resources. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for your time today. I very much appreciate it. God bless. My joy. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed um, watching and or listening to um, to the interview with Dr. Brown. I think it went well. I enjoyed it. And, you know, I, for one, am still uh, continuing to pray uh, that Dr. Brown will become convinced of conditionalism or annihilationism and uh, start defending it even more vigorously in public. But in the meantime, I am incredibly grateful and encouraged uh, that he is comfortable with both sides of this debate fellowshipping with one another, ministering alongside each other. Um, he sees uh, both sides as legitimate evangelical options, and I'm grateful to have people like that um, with the kind of clout, the kind of prestige that Dr. Brown has. So thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for letting me interview. I really appreciated it. And with that, um, I will let everyone leave. Uh, I don't know when I will do another episode of Rethinking Hell Live, uh, whether live or pre-recorded. Um, but again, if you pay, um, if, you, if you follow the Rethinking Hell uh, Facebook page and group and, and my personal Facebook um, profile, whatever, uh, you'll find out as um, new shows come in the future. So thanks for tuning in and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Man, oh, look, maybe we should rethink this whole thing. I mean, I mean, you heard the guy. The pains of eternal torment. Yeah, I gotta rethink this whole thing.